Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Matthew Gibney, the director of the Refugee Studies Centre, and I'd like to welcome you to our weekly seminar in forced migration. This is our last weekly uh, seminar for this term. We'll be back again uh, next term, of course, but uh, we're going to end this term with a bang, I'm pleased to say, because we have with us tonight Dr. Diletta Lauro. Uh, Diletta has recently completed her DPhil, her PhD at uh, Oxford in uh, the Oxford Department for International Development and at the Refugee Studies Centre. Her PhD was entitled Contesting Expulsion, the, Evo the Evolution of Anti-Deportation Activism in the United Kingdom. She, uh, before she did her DPhil, she uh, completed an MSc in Refugee and Forced Migration Studies here at Oxford and also holds an undergraduate degree in international relations with a specialization in political philosophy from the University of St. Andrews. At the moment, Deletta is working uh, for the Refugee Asylum and Migration Policy Project called RAMP, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, organization that aims to assist parliamentarians on a cross-party basis to contribute to political debates and scrutinize legislation on migration, asylum, and refugee resettlement in the UK Parliament. And she was telling me before we uh, came online here that Delette has been working on the UK Borders Bill. So I think that uh, raises many interesting questions about the subject she's talking about tonight. As well as working for RAMP, uh, Delette has uh, done a lot of work on deportation uh, above and beyond her uh, DPhil work including uh, working on, a, on uh, a conference on deportation in, in collaboration with the Oxford Mobility and Migration Network, which was completed recently, recently that explored multi-layered dimensions of deportation across states of origin, transit, and arrival. And that's going to come out uh, soon in a special issue uh, proposal. She's also working currently on an article for citizenship studies on anti-deportation campaigns and the changing contestations of belonging in the UK. What Deletta brings to the topic of deportation, I think, is a very um, uh, well-developed sense of the normative and political issues at stake in it, and also, as we'll see in her talk tonight, a good historical sense of the issue, particularly as it relates to the UK. And tonight, her talk is on the changing contestations of deportation in the UK from race to asylum and humanity. And just before I pass over to, I just want to say that you can submit questions for the speaker uh, anytime once she starts speaking from the Q&A button on your screen, which is in the bottom part of your screen, and I will be able to read them out. If you can try to make those questions as succinct as possible, it will help us to get them across. But without any further ado, let's go over to Deletta. Hello, Deletta. Hi, Matt. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just have um, a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm going to sharing the screen. Um, so just bear with me with one second on Zoom. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Yes, we can Great. see it. Okay, sorry, because I can only see my face. It hasn't been made full screen yet, but we can see it. Okay, well, I would just um, start, start from the beginning. Um, 
<laughs> okay, well then a proper welcome to everyone. And uh, thank you very much for, for coming along to the seminar. And uh, thank you, Matt, for this um, kind introduction, um, listing my long time at the Refugee Study Center, um, which I had the, the, the privilege and the honor to, to be there for a number of years in my master and my PhD. And um, I'm really excited to hear all of your questions later on. Um, so my presentation today um, refers to my some of my findings in my PhD thesis, and I'm going to be talking about the changing contestations of deportation in the United Kingdom. And I want to start with highlighting why it is significant and important for scholars of refugee studies, forced migration studies and migration studies to think about deportation. As we usually think about, especially in the global north, um, the politics of arrival and states policies of deterring asylum seekers to countries in the global north. And here I just want to start with two very quick caveats. One definitional caveat, when I'm talking about deportation, I'm talking about the expulsion of individual non-citizens from the territory of the state and in accordance to immigration law in principle. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a variety of different empirical, legal and policy categories. Um, and I'm thinking about expulsion in a more analytical way as many scholars of deportation have done. And therefore, I'm including the, the different categories of removals, deportation, and voluntary returns in the United Kingdom. Um, and then another caveat is that here I'm particularly looking at the politics of deportation in the global north, although the process of deportation, and as Matt has also mentioned earlier, um, is a very complex and multi-layered process. And, it's very interesting to look how it operates um, in transit countries and in countries of origins as well. But today I'm mainly focusing on the United Kingdom and therefore I'm looking at deportation in the context of the global north and of liberal democracies in particular. So my contention is that while sometimes peripheral to the study of migration and forced migration, deportation lies at the heart of border control. And it simultaneously exposes the fiction and contradictions of fully controlling borders. Indeed, deportation is mainly used by states as a, as a tool of enforcing border controls, as the legal scholar Daniel Kanstrom has argued in 2007. Um, he's also used to um, remove uh, those who committed a criminal offense from the territory of the state, and it encompasses a wide variety of different legal status that people hold and a variety of migratory experiences as well. But what I mean when I talk about the fiction of border controls is that those who are in principle vulnerable to deportation and those who are actually removed are not the same. And those who are finally removed are only a very small minority. And this is because as scholars have shown, deportation is a legally complex power to um, enforce and exercise. It requires international agreements between different states, readmission agreements. Um, it's, it's very expensive. Um, and it also raises a number of contradictions and a number of moral and political controversies, particularly in liberal democracies. And this is another way in which deportation in inhabits the contradictions of borders controls. And this is what I want to focus on in my thesis, in my presentation here. So what are some of these controversies that deportation raises? Deportation raises questions about the different forms of mobility that the state considers legitimate in so far as deporting refugees constitutes a refoulement, um, whereas deporting economic migrants is a legitimate form of uh, border control enforcement from the perspective of the state. Similarly, deportation raises questions about what are the formal criteria of membership and citizenship, and are they just who belongs in the territory of the nation state, considering that deportation only applies to non-citizens and therefore to those who are considered as non-members. Are there any uh, disparities between formal conception of citizenships and moral conceptions of belonging? Another question is the question of justice. Where is justice in the decision to deport? 
have people who have undergone this talent process be fairly uh, processed. Um, and even if that's the case, that the decision to deport is just, are those, um, is the state in enforcing deportation power using force in an appropriate way, um, apprehending people in an appropriate way? There are all these questions about the just enforcement of state power. So how to answer these questions arguably creates conflict in the societies of liberal states between the executive bodies of the state and certain sections of civil society. And this is evidenced by the rise of anti-deportation campaign and the sustained opposition to deportation that has arisen in most liberal democracies from Canada to Germany, to France, to Spain, to the United Kingdom. In this talk, I focus in particular on the United Kingdom and on the contestations of deportation in the UK. And this is based on my PhD thesis, where I have investigated the ways in which various civil society groups have contested deportation in the UK at different historical times. Um, and I started in the late 1970s, when deportation powers really became um, in their contemporary modern form after the 1971 Act. And I've just stopped before the Brexit referendum in 2016, where a whole new group of European citizens became subject and vulnerable to deportation powers. And I think what this historical analysis has served me to do has been the fact that I, looking at the changing contestations of deportation is really revealing of the plurality of interpretations of the legitimacy of deportation, border controls, and the boundaries of membership in a way that are different from the answers and the views provided by the state. So I've used a qualitative and historical methodology in my research. I have relied on extensive archival research and documentary analysis of the written material produced by anti-deportation campaigns. So these informal great collection archivals in local libraries in multiple locations of the UK. And I've also relied on in-depth semi-structured interviews with key anti-deportation activists in multiple geographical locations. And I'm happy to talk a bit more about my methodology if you're interested. But in this presentation, I want to focus on how have anti-deportation activists framed their political and normative claims against deportation during the period between 1979 and 2016, and what is the transformative potential of these claims? And by transformative potential, I mean in challenging the statist understandings of deportation, um, but also what kind of possibilities of political change have can they bring? I think that's the other more practical question that arises as well. So why looking at the context of the United Kingdom? Um, there have been various studies of anti-deportation campaigns throughout Europe and, and in the US and Canada. The UK um, surprisingly um, has been not so much the focus of attention of this literature. However, the UK constitutes a very interesting case um, and relatively unexplored because um, in some sense, the UK has been pioneering deportation powers um, already from the, from the 80s, really, well into the 1990s and the 2000s. And we've seen the trajectory, if we look at the statistics, has, has been an upward trajectory of removals and deportations. Um, however, particularly since 2006, and then again after 2010, we have seen um, a, a sort of downward curve in the enforcement, um, in the enforcement removals of different categories of migrants from the UK. And particularly in the last two years, the numbers have been much lower because of course with the COVID crisis, um, the whole apparatus of enforcement has not really worked. Um, so we have seen a downward curve. But even more recently in the last uh, five to six years, removals are not as high as they were in the previous years. And that's also an interesting question. Um, but in this context, we also see that the subjects of deportations have also changed from mainly Commonwealth migrants in the 60s and 70s um, to then increasingly um, rejected asylum seekers in the early um, 2000s to then um, foreign national offenders and EU migrants who were seen to be violating EU treaty rights from the 2010 onwards. And these patterns of removals have very much reflected the evolution of immigration policy in the United Kingdom. 
and I'm happy to talk as well a little bit more about how these policies have um, influenced deportation and contestations of deportation in the United Kingdom. But what I really want to focus on in this talk is to really trace um, one of my main findings of my research, which was a change in the contestations of deportation from a radical, ideologically informed and openly political form of contestation in the decades of the 1979 to 1989, so the 80s, um, to one that has become more reformist, more pragmatic and more humanitarian in the period from the 1990 until 2016. And in this talk, I would particularly focus on the period from 2000 to 2016. Um, so if we jump straight into the decade of the 80s, um, I want to talk a little bit about the context here. Um, obviously, uh, the year 1979 is the year where Margaret Thatcher came into power in the United Kingdom, and this whole period kind of crystallized the immigration controls of the previous two decades and started to focus on curbing family reunification um, and introducing stringent nationality and citizenship law. And in terms of the social actors involved in this anti-deportation campaigns at this time, we can see um, a mobilization across two main groups of support, a local group mainly formed by families, by um, law centers and radical lawyers, and by political activists. And in terms of political activists, we can see um, um, black uh, autonomous radical anti-racist groups such as the A Asian Youth Movement, um, have been heavily involved in local anti-deportation activism, but also more far-right uh, Marxist and Trotskyist groups um, coming out from a group called International Socialists back in the 70s in the United Kingdom. Um, and also we can see an appeal to wider, more um, established institutions such as faith communities um, from a, a multiplicity of confessions and faiths. Um, and also we can see the involvement of trade unions who particularly in the 1980s formed an alliance with this radical anti-deportation groups against the Thatcher government. If we look into the arguments, the political claims of these campaigns, we can see some really interesting examples. We can see that across the material of anti-deportation campaigns, a slogan such as British immigration laws are racist and sexist became really dominant at the time. And this campaign on behalf of Afia Begum is a good illustration of this very uh, oppositional and strong language used by the campaign at the time. Um, she was a woman from Bangladesh who had obtained the right to stay in the UK to marry her legally settled fiancé and bring her young daughter and unite with her father. However, her husband to be died in a fire just shortly before her arrival and the Home Office um, did not allow her to remain in the United Kingdom and issued a removal order. She appealed the decision and a very lively and confrontational campaign started in East London, um, mainly organized by the Workers Against Racism group, um, but also had the support of more than 70 MPs. Um, and the language of this campaign really illustrates the kinds of arguments that these campaigns use at the time. They really focused on the idea that the very, the very immigration laws that deportation was trying to enforce were racially discriminatory. The campaign also highlighted the disadvantaged position of women within the immigration laws at the time, referring to some rules in place until 1985, according to which it was much more burdensome for women to bring their spouses, their male spouses from other countries, whereas for men it was easier. And the case was also brought to the European Court of Human Rights. Another interesting aspect of this campaign is that the argument was really against all immigration controls. They asked whether it was a crime to be an immigrant. And they really got to the idea that migrant illegality is something that the state artificially constructs as a policy category. And instead they contrast that with a view um, based on freedom of movement, um, which is understood as an economic necessity in a world rifled by economic inequalities. So almost like a Marxist defense of freedom of movement. <laughs> 
if we unpack a bit more this argument about discrimination and racism and sexism of immigration controls, and, and this really happened in the interviews with my participants, um, I think the crux of that argument is that immigration laws at the time in the 70s and 80s in Britain were seen to be shaping a differential access to mobility for racialized minorities. And my participants cited um, the unilateral imposition of visa requirements by the United Kingdom, which was happening for the very first times in the, in the mid to late 80s, um, and also the 1971 Immigration Act, which had the derogation from immigration controls for the descendants of white uh, settlers in UK's ex-colonies. Um, and so, Another theme that was very much um, came across in the arguments of these campaigns was the theme of colonialism and the, leg and the legacy of colonialism. Um, encapsulated in the slogan, we are here because you were there, this legacy of British colonialism was very much embroiled in the family and in the histories of the activists um, that I interviewed, especially for those who were involved in anti-importation activism and were themselves from an immigrant background who were second generation immigrants in the 70s, also in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, this played very much a big role. One of my participants described the experience of his grandfather from India fighting for the British um, in, in, World War, in World War II as one of the reasons why he was inspired to, um, to campaign against deportation because he really exposed the dichotomy between the sacrifices of the imperial subjects of, of, of the British state and the experiences of discrimination that he and his family experienced in housing, in employment, in education when growing up in Britain in the 60s. Um, and, and this made the, really the role for a very particular type of moral and political argument tailored to the British state based on the legacy of colonialism, based on the past injustice committed by the British state. However, if we move to the arguments and the context of more contemporary campaign, we find a bit of a different picture. So what I have described so far has been a very structural, historical, critique of the very justice of immigration controls. And it really has raised these themes of racism and the legacy of colonialism. But when we go in the 1990s and then particularly in the 2000s and in the early 2010s, we see a different picture. First of all, we see a different picture in terms of the context and the actors involved in this kind of activism. Uh, that relatively simple pattern became increasingly more complex. We see the emergence of new collective umbrella-like anti-deportation networks. Um, and they really had the aim to expand, systematize, and professionalize previous forms of grassroots activism. We see the emergence of regional groups in Greater Manchester, in the West Midlands, and of course in London. Um, and we see also the emergence in 1995 of the National Coalition of Anti-Deportation Campaigns, which came out of 25 anti-deportation campaigns that came together in a church um, um, in Hackney um, at, at one of um, the, the vigils for one of the campaigns. And uh, this organization became the main NGO involved with um, various aspects of the enforcement process from deportation to detention and really contesting uh, both individual cases and then later on more generally policies around enforcement and with the removal process. And today this organization still exists. It has changed its name to Right to Remain in 2013. Um, but it's still um, uh, one of the major players in contesting enforcement in the United Kingdom today. Um, so if we move now to the, to the arguments used by these campaigns uh, already from the 2000s. And here I'm just going to give some snapshots because I know that we have very little time um, of some campaigns. So uh, there were various, during the 2000s, there were various campaigns on behalf of asylum seekers who were undergoing their asylum case. And they had the first um, rejection and they were fighting their case in the British courts. Um, and 
really one of the most common themes of these contemporary arguments and against deportation was to argue that people were not failed asylum seekers, but that they were genuine refugees. And they would emphasize the notion of asylum as a harm in people's countries of origin. So usually campaign would refer to uh, people's past experiences of persecution, um, which would serve as evidence of future um, risk of persecution or severe human rights harm if returned in their country of origin. So this argument really um, has a bit more of a limited transformative potential than the wide ranging critiques of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, because effectively they argue that the people that the state is attempting to deport are genuine refugees rather than voluntary migrants. And in this sense, asylum is seen simply as an exception to immigration controls, as asylum seekers and refugees are seen as this particular group of migrants who is illegitimate to deport. So in that sense, is as anti-deportation campaigners are using an example exception that already exists in the in the way the asylum system and secondly mainly in the examples that i've looked at people have focused on civic and political persecution um, so in that sense they conform to the status and legal def definition of refugeehood rather than expanding its normative criteria uh, in some cases they have focused on um, the, the um, people's sexual preferences and they have tried to expand the notion of who belongs um, to a particular social group as one of the criteria for persecution um, so they have tried to use the current law to push for more expansive interpretation of the refugee convention. And also these claims are often based on representation of extreme vulnerability, and they try to make the case um, of particular people um, as very resonant and very expressive of human vulnerability um, to highlight the danger of returning people to their country of origin. But this can have also the negative effect of um, couching asylum and human rights claims through this emotive and affective lenses of vulnerability. And when people do not conform with these representations of vulnerabilities, then it's harder to argue for their case. And it becomes almost a race to the bottom of who's the most vulnerable. And this is something that anti-deportation activists themselves have recognized as one of the limitations, but as a necessary tactical argument. Um, so if we then look also more broadly at the claims of this um, wider actors, more collective actors, these national campaigns, we can also see in the placards and slogans a shift to um, the themes of common humanity, asylum as persecution, um, as, as seen in these placards. Um, however, I want to emphasize that um, this, this more um, collective campaigns talk about a conception of humanity that is more universalist um, compared to the very historically situated and political arguments that um, anti-deportation campaigners in the 70s and 80s were making. Um, and it also refers to a substantive set of obligations um, to which all asylum seekers are entitled. And, and they go beyond the idea of not deporting them to a country where they might be persecuted, but they also include a humane treatment here in the host country, in the United Kingdom. Indeed, much of the advocacy of the National Coalition of Anti-Deportation Campaign focused on the dehumanizing provisions introduced by recent law. Um, for example, you know, uh, in 1999, with the 1999 Immigration and Nationality Act, um, sorry, Immigration and Asylum Act, um, dispersal, forcible dispersal was introduced. Um, a number of restrictions to welfare uh, for asylum seekers were introduced. And these were very much the object of campaigning. Um, and in that sense, these organizations focus on policy rather than particular cases. And it focused on asylum seekers' rights at different stages of their um, processing. So it does not only talk about uh, the rights of legally recognized refugees. Another focus of 
a more contemporary anti-deportation campaigning groups was to emphasize the importance of humanity and justice in the enforcement process. We see a number of reports that have been produced by these organizations that emphasize the excessive use of force and a number of abuses committed by um, private security companies to which the Home Office has outsourced um, the removal and detention process. And we also see um, very much collaboration with other humanitarian um, NGOs, with other charities in uh, really denouncing these abuses. And what's also interesting is the change in the language. These reports are couched in very professional Polish language. They use the methodology of policy research um, and they really aim to influence policymakers and decision makers. They want to be perceived as legitimate by this policy sphere and sphere of increasingly professionalized and specialized NGOs focused on asylum and refugee rights. Another snapshot is the fact that organizations such as the National Coalitions of Anti-Deportation Campaigns then right to remain since 2013 has increasingly focused on detention rather than deportation. Already by 2015 and 2016, detention really became the main focus of this organization. And I think this is for a number of reasons. Firstly, because there was a political momentum building around challenging immigration detention, particularly since 2014 and 2015, both in parliament, in the manifesto of many political parties, um, and also by NGOs. But also arguably, Contesting detention is easier for anti deportation campaigners because it's, detention is less embroiled and particularly indefinite detention, detention without a time limit, is less embroiled in foundational debates about the legitimacy of borders. One can have a position that is against indefinite detention, but still maintain for a degree of border control. And also one can use various arguments to frame opposition to detention and in particular to indefinite detention, such as considering it as a human rights violation of people's civil liberties and human rights, especially the lack of time limit. Also considering it as preventing access to justice and legal representation as it anecdotally and shown by research, uh, qualitative research. And also the fact using more consequentialist arguments, uh, focusing on the consequences and the expenses and inefficiencies of using the detention state to this degree, if in the end, not a huge proportions of those in detentions are in fact removed. So I want to argue that we have seen a shift from this um, more political, um, more structural form of contestation of deportation to a more humanitarian and more narrow and more pragmatic form of contestation. And I see this as a broader process of humanitarization and de-radicalization of anti-deportation activism, which mirrors similar development in the humanitarian world and in the development sector. By humanitarization, I mean a process whereby considerations about human suffering to take priority over highlighting the ways in which the state practices reproduce structural and historically situated inequalities. And by de-radicalization, I mean a process whereby anti-deportation activists are less willing to challenge the status quo of existing system of immigration controls. Um, sometimes, obviously, um, similar arguments have been made by um, scholars of humanitarianism and immigration controls, particularly in France, such as Fassan, uh, Tiktin. Um, sometimes a the notion of the humanitarian is contraposed to the notion of the political. Um, I think this type of anti-deportation activism is in the contemporary times is still very much political. It still has a political function of influencing public opinion and decision makers. However, it's less radical. So thinking about the transformative potential um, and, and the chances for political change, some scholars, some critical sc scholars of humanitarianism, um, including Tiktin, think that some regimes of care um, and I would add the underlying humanitarian justifications, ultimately work to displace the possibilities for larger form of collective change, particularly for the most disenfranchised. Um, 
And while we, I have shown so far that this is true, that these radical arguments really get at the legitimacy of the whole system of immigration controls um, have been disappearing and decreasing over the years and therefore displacing the possibilities for that type of critique. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to um, put a stark and binary and to some extent romanticized dichotomy between the humanitarian and the political. And by the way, nor does Tiktin in her book. Um, I think it's important to understand, and I hope that I have shown a little bit in this presentation, the fact that humanitarian frames and arguments can be internally diverse, as I have shown that more collective and issue-based campaigns can also entail a more substantive set of obligations for asylum seekers based on more universalist arguments, that they can highlight severe human rights abuses that can arise at the stage of enforcement of immigration controls. And I also wanted to show the instrumental utility of these humanitarian frames, perhaps in attracting a wider number and wider range of supporters and attracting a cross section of society to the cause of contesting very egregious um, violation of human rights in the enforcement process. Um, so I think when we're thinking about this process of humanitarization and de-radicalization of um, anti-deportation campaigns, we have, to, we have to be careful and we have to assess the pros and cons. I think what's really happening is that this type of activism is characterized by small and incremental steps towards achieving political change. And they're focused on short-term tactical and individual wins focus on particular policies or particular subgroup of migrants around which there is particular consensus and resonance across society, rather than making systemic critiques um, and trying to change public attitudes or try to change entire policies. But I think as scholars of um, migration and forced migration um, and deportation, um, I think we have to look at both what these forms of contestations obscure um, as very critic, as critical scholars has very much shown, but also what these possibilities for political change this approach illuminates. Um, and also another thing to remember is that these changes do not happen in a social, political and contextual vacuum, but they are led by economic, political, social forces um, that really enable certain arguments to be possible at particular points in time. And I'm happy to you know, um, unpack a little bit about how the context has um, impacted the, the, the arguments used by different anti-petition activists at different points in time in the q and if you're, if you're interested. So this is all from my presentation today. <laughs>